So I decided to join Stuart's uh, group because of his work on cold fusion. Uh, the, the year was 1989. Uh, it was reported that uh, nuclear fusion was observed in test two. Uh, of course, there was a great excitement uh, across the world of physics and uh, certainly in public as well. Uh, I was a theory student at the time, uh, but our student office was uh, close to Stewart's, and you know how it goes. Stewart would walk into the office from time to time and tell us something interesting. So I felt this gravitational pull from Stewart. And sitting there, I thought, you know, gee, the Stewart and those experimentalists, they're about to change the world. I better join them. So um, I, 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 I talked to Stuart and uh, went through the process. By the time I finished what's on hand and uh, made it uh, to Stuart's group, uh, things have changed. Code fusion had been pretty much debunked. And Stuart made a contribution uh, to, to this uh, debunking. So this is a letter by Stuart and his then postdoc, Danny Krakauer, uh, to, to the Nature magazine. Let me read the first paragraph. It says, Jones et al. have claimed to have observed cold nuclear fusion. Their data, however, have a peculiar characteristic which may indicate a systematic bias in the data collection procedure. What is this peculiar characteristic? So this is the original data of Jones et al. And uh, uh, the vertical axis is uh, foreground to background ratio. So if it's above one, there's some neutron signal that indicates, supports uh, nuclear fusion. And the horizontal axis is just wrong number. And uh, Stuart and Danny noticed, I think some, uh, uh, several speakers have uh, uh, mentioned this, that the error bar uh, varies greatly from run to run. And when it gets close to the threshold, the error bar shrinks. So uh, to make it even clearer, they replotted the data right here. So same vertical axis, but the horizontal axis is now converted to run length. The smaller error bar indicates the run was longer, more statistics. So now you see an interesting feature. To understand uh, what kind of a bias that could cause this uh, uh, feature, uh, Stuart and Danny ran a computer game, a simulation, and they assumed the following scenario. That an experimenter is watching the data as it comes in and with a hand on the kill switch, okay? So uh, if a data point comes in uh, right away, high, good, kill the run, and let's record this data point, it's a good point. And if the data point comes in low, well, let's give it some more time. And uh, eventually it will come back up, and so, oh, well, that's, yeah, another good data point. Okay, now you imagine sometimes the data point will come in low and stay low. At which point the experimenter think, well, you know, maybe something wrong with the apparatus. Let me go check on it. Okay, so you adjust something and come back, restart the run. So if you follow this recipe, as Stuart and Danny did, you would uh, reproduce this feature. Okay, so there, there it goes. Uh, I made it to Stuart's group, yet my dream thesis project was no longer available. <laughs> so I had to uh, work on Stuart's other idea, which, which is the trapping radioactive atoms. Now, uh, our previous speaker, Guy Rong, has uh, spoken uh, on this project. So let me just show you a few uh, photos. The experiment took place at the 88-inch cyclotron, and uh, the oven was inside the cave. Uh, the atomic beam line goes through this thick concrete wall, and the trap is conveniently located uh, outside. Uh, Song Kuang Shang and I did most of the laser work, but many more people helped. Uh, there's Brian, there's Eric Wasserman, uh, Chris Bowers, Justin Mortara, uh, and uh, Kevin Coulter, Linda Young, all contributed uh, to this project. And we succeeded in trapping sodium-21 atoms. Now, Song, Song Kuang had very good eyesight. He could look into this uh, fairly bright chamber and identify uh, as few as 100 atoms. And in fact, this was a well-kept secret, that uh, he was the one who first identified uh, sodium-21 atoms in the trap before we uh, had a camera uh, uh, on it. So, 
So later on, we took a picture of the trapped atoms. This is about 1,000 atoms. So what did it prove? I recently reread the paper and uh, found this sentence. I'm pretty sure uh, Stuart wrote this sentence. He said that this experiment demonstrates that it is possible to load traps efficiently enough to study very short-lived atoms. So that was the key. Uh, certainly, uh, others, Steve Chu, uh, have uh, demonstrated laser trapping of stable isotopes of sodium. But the key challenge is that we only had very little material to work with. For sodium-21, we could produce about 10 picograms per day, whereas with the stable isotopes, uh, I don't know how much they actually use, but it's reasonable to use 10 milligrams per day. So there's a huge difference in availability of, of material. So for us, trapping efficiency uh, was the key for this very first experiment. It's still the key today when we try to trap rare uh, radioactive atoms. So we showed that this can be done. And with that, I uh, graduated, left, and more students joined this project. And so here I only show uh, uh, Nick Schelzo, who also received a PhD on, on this project, and uh, a longtime collaborator of, St uh, of Stuart, uh, Paul Vetter, who's here. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Paul uh, is, uh, has put in more effort than any of us in making sure that the experiment reached its physics goal. So now let me jump a, a, a few years ahead. And I, I went to Jilla, did a postdoc, then moved to Argonne and started a new uh, trapping program at Argonne National Laboratory. And there we took this idea of trapping radioactive atoms and pushed to different uh, directions. In one direction, we, we tried to trap very short-lived uh, uh, radioactive atoms. And this is so helium-6 with a half-life of 0 0.8 seconds and helium-8, 0.1 second. No problem, we could trap both isotopes and uh, uh, we can do laser spectroscopy on these trapped atoms. Trapping is wonderful. Once the atom is located in a, in a dot and uh, uh, the signal to noise ratio of that single atom in the trap is, is superb. So even with that, the very first helium-8 atom we observed in the trap, we could accumulate a reasonable spectrum just with that one atom before it decays. And with more atoms in the trap, we can determine its resonant frequency, and then using the precise uh, theory on the atomic structure, we can uh, extract the nuclear charge radius of helium-6 and helium-8. These were determined for the first time. And these are interesting nuclei. They are simple, so calculable with nuclear structure theories, and uh, they, 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 have, uh, they, they have very structu exotic structure. They, they, they are formed by a tightly bound core, that's alpha-like core, and loosely bound neutrons on the outside. So by doing these measurements and compare with the results of the nuclear structure calculations, we essentially test our understanding of the nuclear force in these neutron-rich uh, environment. Uh, I should point out that uh, I, I just met uh, Art Poscanza uh, out uh, here uh, during this meeting. And he's the one who actually originally discovered the helium-8 isotope. So, so it's really an honor for me uh, to, to meet him. So that's one line of work we pursued. The other line of work went to isotopes of very long half-lives. So these are isotopes that are uh, produced uh, by cosmic rays or by uh, nuclear activities uh, of, of uh, 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 mankind and uh, they are released into the atmosphere. So you can find these isotopes here in this hall in, 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 the, in the atmosphere, and also in old water, in old ice, so they can be used for radioisotope dating. Basically, we can use them to trace the movement of fluids in the Earth environment. The isotopes are Krypton-85 with an 11-year half-life, Argon-39, 270-year half-life, and Krypton-81 with 230 thousand year half-life. So different half-lives covering different age ranges for radioisotope dating. Okay? Uh, for comparison, this is uh, the age range that's covered by radiocarbon dating. 
The difficulties of detecting these isotopes are uh, that their isotopic abundance uh, are very low, 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 13, and in this case, argon-39 is 10 to the minus 16. That makes it difficult to detect them. Now, for carbon-14, its isotopic abundance is also low. This problem had been solved uh, by uh, accelerated mass spectrometry method. That method was pioneered by Rich Muller here at Berkeley in the 70s. In fact, uh, uh, the experiment, the first experiment for, uh, was done uh, using the 88-inch cyclotron. Uh, the cyclotron has an illustrious history, and uh, a lot of great experiments have uh, happened there. Uh, but I think Muller's experiment on carbon-14 should be ranked as one of the top highlights uh, at this 88-inch cyclotron. People also try to solve the uh, detection of these uh, radio noble gas isotopes using the accelerator method, but uh, 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 my friend uh, Walter Kuchera of the University of Vienna found that in order to detect krypton-81, for example, he needed a cyclotron to raise energy to GeV in order uh, to avoid the isobar contamination. So that made the method impractical. We solved the method using a tabletop apparatus, basically an atom trap. So we feed krypton gas in here to slow the atoms down and then capture the uh, atom with these laser beams that we feed in through these uh, windows. And then the single atom appears as a bright dot uh, in the middle of the chamber. We named this method atom trap trace analysis, or ATA in short. This is a, a CCD camera image of a single krypton-81 atom in the trap. And if you uh, define a region of interest and integrate the photon counts and monitor it over time, you get this plot. Basically, zero atom, that's some photon scattering background, one atom, and two atoms. Sometimes we capture two accidentally uh, together. So the counting rate nowadays are very good. When we started this effort, we could trap krypton-81 at uh, maybe a few atoms per day. But nowadays, uh, we can uh, count them at thousands per, per hour. So how do we know that this is a krypton-81 atom? We know it by where we park the laser frequency. So different isotopes occur uh, at different frequent laser frequency positions because of the isotope shift. Okay? So if you do a quick laser frequency scan, you see six gigantic peaks. Krypton has six stable isotopes. So on camera, you will see flashes or big balls of atoms coming by. Okay? This is where we would expect uh, the uh, krypton-81. This is where krypton-85 would occur. This is the odd isotope group. The odd even are separated because of the hyperfine structure. Okay, so let's look at this stable isotope, krypton-83. Its abundance is 10%. So when I first showed people uh, uh, about the spectrum and then said, well, this is where we would search for krypton-81, krypton-85, the most common criticism or skepticism I've received is this. You say, well, it looks very clean right here, but remember you need to blow this figure up by 10 orders magnitude before the 81, 85 signal would occur. Lots of things could happen, and indeed, uh, this kind of background problem had already prevented several uh, attempts uh, in the past trying to solve this problem with uh, laser methods. But Stuart was always very supportive. Uh, in fact, in my treasure box, I kept a copy of my first proposal with Stuart's markings on it. Okay? And uh, st as usual, Stuart uh, did a lot of uh, uh, corrections and suggestions, uh, just as he did on my thesis a few years earlier. Um, uh, so I, 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 in my case, I don't think he was trying to teach me to write a Hemingway. It was more like trying to teach me uh, elementary grammar, English grammar. So, uh, but overall, he said, it's an excellent proposal. Why don't you ask for more? All right. He was right. Oh, uh, it did take more, but this initial amount was very important for us to, to get started. This was 1997. Uh, I was new at Argonne. Stuart, of course, was already at Berkeley, but he came to Argonne very often. Yesterday, Bob Kahn told us it's, it's, it's his way of uh, getting around the Berkeley bureaucracy. So thank you, uh, LBL. Um, 
Uh, but there's another reason, I think. Paul, at the time, was attending the University of Chicago. He was attending college. So Stuart, on his many world trips, would find every excuse to stop by Chicago, and, uh, which is great for me, because I get to see Stuart quite often, and this kind of uh, encouragement was exactly what I needed to hear. Later, uh, after we have identified the Krypton 81 and Krypton 85 peaks, uh, we showed that it's actually very clean. Notice that the atom, this is the atom counts versus laser frequency. The atom counts are zero on both sides of these peaks, indicating that there is no contamination from this nearby peak that's 11 orders magnitude higher. Okay? Um, no, no contamination from different isotopes no contamination from different isobar, different species of atoms or molecules. Uh, I think this is unique among all trace analysis methods. Okay? Uh, the reason we can, uh, that it's so clean is because we detect the atom in a fundamentally different way than everybody else. Uh, for each atom, we collect 1,000 photons in a burst. So it's a, it's a gigantic coincidence measurement. What we are, uh, have worked on for many years and we'll continue to work on is, again, trapping efficiency. As the trapping efficiency moves towards 100%, the amount of water or ice sample we would ask uh, for, for, for geologists to collect goes down, hopefully, to a, to a kilogram. So uh, this was 1969, er, uh, Erschke and Lusli's work at the University of Bern, which began this uh, dream of radiocrypton dating. And 90, 1997, Walter Kuchera's work with accelerator method, and this is where we are today. Uh, we need about 100 kilograms of water for each analysis, or about 40 kilograms of ice. So, uh, so we are very comfortable in, uh, in the region of dating groundwater. We are touching the uh, polar ice work. So, and of course, we will continue to work on it, hopefully to make it even better, easier to use uh, for, for our geology colleagues. But uh, as it stands right now, it's already useful. So we have already started doing some dating work. Uh, we collaborate with the IAEA Water Resource Program. This is one of their maps showing that there are 37 major aquifers uh, in the world. And uh, uh, I'll give you one example of uh, our work. This is on the Great Artesian Basin uh, underneath the outback of Australia. There, we sampled uh, uh, waters uh, along a, a path and then provided uh, uh, analyzed Krypton-81 and, and determined its Krypton-81 age. So from that, uh, hydrologists can model the flow of the water. Now, uh, without the Krypton-81 age, hydrologists can go to the field and measure the water level. That can be done easily. What they don't have information on is the flow resistivity over a distance of 100 kilograms for example. That depends on rock properties, formations, and can vary many orders of magnitude from place to place, okay? So by providing the age information, they can use it to calibrate their model, and then once they have a reliable model, they can start to answer some policy questions, some practical questions out on how to sustainably use this precious resource. So, so that's why. Uh, the hydrology community is very interested in the Krypton 81H. In the past two years, we have uh, collaborated on about a dozen projects and analyzed about 80 samples collected from all over the world. And I think you're seeing the beginning of a long-term worldwide effort uh, on groundwater dating. Now, one of the point here is not groundwater, it's polar ice. What glaciologists uh, are doing is to drill kilometer deep cores, pull up these ice cores, and analyze information to learn about the history of the Earth climate. We would love to uh, apply Krypton 81 dating on these uh, core ice, but we are not there yet. Remember, we need 40 kilograms of ice, and that's uh, uh, too large for a core study. Okay? I think we need to improve the efficiency by yet another factor of five before we can actually date ice cores. Meanwhile, uh, our glaciology colleagues have pointed out that there are old ice and that's re-emerging in this ice margin area uh, outside because old ice is being 
slowly pushed out towards, towards edge. So they, they re-emerge. And since it's near surface, you can get 40 kilograms or even 400 kilograms, as our collaborators uh, demonstrated here. They went to this region, dig up ice, and then put it into a big vacuum pot, melt the ice, collect the gas, distill it into a krypton, then send it to our, our lab. So we did a first feasibility study, and we found in the Taylor Glacier region uh, an old ice with an age of about, uh, about 120,000 years. So that's our first work. And uh, our idea is to go sample at many places. There are so-called blue ice areas where the glaciologists suspect uh, that where there are old ice or perhaps even older ice than the bottom of the ice core. So, and there are hundreds of these sites uh, across the continent of Antarctica. So that's another area we want to make a contribution. Uh, a third area is to map ocean currents. Water circle around the world in this so-called the Great Conveyor Belt with a time scale of about 2,000 years. This has already been mapped with carbon-14. But carbon-14, with a half-life of 5,700 years, is a bit too long-lived for many of the detailed studies. So oceanographers would love to, to use argon-39. This is a Goldilocks isotope with a, just the right half-life for the job, 268-year half-life. Okay? The challenge, again, is its isotopic abundance. It's 1,000 times even rarer than the Krypton-81. Okay? So a couple of years ago, we converted our Krypton machine temporarily into argon and just to do a feasibility study. We showed that we can see argon-39 and, and even at the 10 to the minus 16th level, we did not see any contamination problems. But the counting rate was very low. So we, we need to improve the counting rate. And in fact, our colleague at the University of Heidelberg had already built a dedicated argon uh, ADA machine and demonstrate the counting rate to be of a factor of five higher. I think together we need to make another improvement, another factor of five, before we can uh, take on this challenge. Uh, this time we'll be mapping uh, ocean water uh, around the world. So uh, we've come a long way since first th uh, Stuart first thought about trapping radioactive atoms, and uh, Stuart has always uh, uh, watched this development with satisfaction and encouraged us along. Uh, uh, my colleagues at Argonne, uh, Roy Holt, who is a longtime uh, friend and colleague of Stuart and Joyce, and uh, uh, the people who have worked on the trace analysis work are Tom O'Connor, Peter Mueller, Wei Jen, Jake Zapala, and Kevin Bailey. And uh, so this concludes uh, this part of the talk. Now, uh, yesterday, my friend Dima Budkar uh, reminded me that the, so far, uh, another area of uh, Stuart's work has not been mentioned. Um, so this was Stuart's involvement on atomic parity violation. It's an area that Eugene Cummings pioneered, and uh, in fact, this is a collaboration between Dima uh, and uh, uh, Dave DeMille and Stuart. Uh, on the atomic parity violation of, of ytterbium. The apparatus uh, is like this. You know, ytterbium atoms coming out in a beam, and then you have an uh, uh, arrangement of E field and B field and photon excitation collections. And the goal is to construct a pseudo scalar. Okay? And if the atomic transition rate depends on this pseudo-scalar, then you have observed parity violation in atoms. And if you look at this one, uh, it's p-odd, parity-odd, and uh, t-even. So it conserves uh, time reversal symmetry. And indeed, they saw a, uh, a uh, dependence in the excitation rate. And from that, they have observed uh, parity violation in ytterbium. And this is, I think, is the largest parity violation effect so far observed. So, and I, uh, and uh, these are the papers published. Uh, Stuart participated in the early effort of this project and co-supervised a number of students and postdocs on this project. But uh, what about, uh, when the papers were published and Stuart felt he didn't make significant enough contribution, so he was not a co-author, 
but uh, Dima thought Stuart made an important contribution to this uh, project. And so here I mention it, his, his contribution. Thank you very much.